Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. It's a real honor to me to give the annual Hayek Lecture. And it's particularly nice to be here at the International, at the Institute for Economic Affairs, which I've heard about, studied about, and looked into for, for many years. I've had a long interest in how economics is used in policy, the, the world of ideas and the, the world of, of government. And I think this institute has proven over the years how important ideas are for good government. I read in thinking about this lecture that the founder of the institute, Anthony Fisher, first got the idea when he was a fighter pilot in World War II, flying for the Royal Air Force. And he read in Reader's Digest the condensed version of the road to serfdom. And he said, these are some ideas that I want to promote. And, and after the war, he did and set up this institution. So it's a very important institution, and I'm happy to be here. I also admire its focus on free markets and all the benefits that kind of philosophy gives to people. And also the stress on, if you like, nonpartisan issues. Anyone who wants to listen to the benefits of free markets and free society is welcome. That's what I think a good institution should be all about. Now tonight I want to focus on lessons learned from, from our experience over the last few years in the financial crisis and the slow recovery of the Great Recession, because I think it's tremendously important to figure out what went wrong, what we can do better in the future, if you like the lessons learned. And to me, there's a striking similarity between my country, the United States, and the UK in terms of what actually happened. And what I'm going to present really are ideas that came to me from thinking about the United States. And actually, they come even before that from thinking about particular kinds of policies in the United States, monetary policy, which is my, my expertise, if you like, or my love. And seeing how things done in monetary policy actually extended to other kinds of policies. And I think that's actually going to be useful for thinking about the UK as well. So let me begin with kind of a description of where we are in the US and in the UK. And remember, this, these ideas are, are coming from my first thinking about the US and then thinking about the UK. And I think they're, I, think I hope you find them interesting. So first, let's take a look at this chart. This is a chart of real GDP in the United States. And you can see it goes back to before the crisis in 2007. The red line shows the decline in real GDP, the total amount of goods and services produced in a given year in the United States, adjusted for inflation. And there's this big dip. That's the Great Recession associated with the financial crisis, and then this recovery. And I've superimposed on that the trend, the previous trend of real GDP from 2000 to 2007. And you can see this looks to me like a great disappointment. We've had a recovery in the sense that growth has has proceeded at a rate, um, positive rate. Um, actually, as one small correction, the point at the end now is a negative. We had the last observation from the first quarter of this year is, is negative 2.9% uh, for various reasons. Hopefully, there'll be a recovery in the second quarter. But regardless, it's a very, it's a disappointing performance. And, and why is it disappointing? Because we didn't bounce back like we have in previous recoveries. And I'll show you a chart for that in a minute. Now what about the UK? So let's look at the same kind of chart for uh, the UK. And this is basically the same kind of concept, looking at the behavior since 2007 before the Great Recession and then the recovery. And superimposing on that the trend line, roughly the trend line from 2000 through 2007. And you can see it's, it's quite similar. It's worse because it's really just even slower than the trend line before. The US was close to the trend line, but not that much different. So in both of these cases, there's been a, a disappointing lack of a recovery. And one way to think about that is to compare it to the most recent deep recession. And I'll look, focus on the United States first, and there it is. So this is the early 1980s. Um, 
I'm going back to this in a minute, but you can see the same thing, raw GDP declines, but then it bounces back. And if we had seen this kind of recovery now, we'd all already be back producing many more trillion dollars a year. So that is really, a, in a way, a typical recovery. I'll talk about that some more in a minute. The same thing is true for the UK. If you look at that same period in the UK, and I look at real GDP, the red line, and I just superimpose the red line for the trend there to visualize you can see the bounce back was just much better. So this is kind of what I think is a typical recovery, the kind of things that, that should happen. So not only have we had this very deep recession, but we've had this not so great recovery, great recession, not so great recovery. And the question is why? And I think the, I think the answer is related. The same kind of things have affected both. Now other people have different views and I wanna just touch on those briefly. One view is, hey, what do you expect? You had this great recession. It's not going to bounce back that fast. This is, this is worse. Well, I think what I, some of these charts illustrate that's not the case. But here's an, one that I think is even more convincing, and, and now I'm just referring to the United States. But this is a picture of the recovery speed for all of the deep recessions associated with the financial crisis in the United States going back to the 1800s, 1882. And the red line is the growth rate in the first two years of all of those, all of those uh, recoveries. And you can see the average is about 6%. That's the blue line. The one we've had recently is about 2%. So, and it's well below all of the, all of the green ones. So, so it really is not correct to say that this is what you expect from a financial crisis, deep recovery. Something else is going on. There's other theories. One, one theory which is been offered more recently is, well, the income distribution has spread, widened, and therefore, you, you know, you're going to get slower growth because when the income distribution widens, uh, people at the lower end of the income distribution who consume more as a fraction of their income than those at the top, um, they're getting relatively less than before. So you're going to get less consumption, if you like, before because of that spread. So the economy is going to grow slowly. So you should have higher savings rates and and a, and a slower recovery. Well, that doesn't fit the data either. The fast recoveries I showed you, especially in the United States, uh, are periods where savings rates are even higher than they have been recently. So, so it doesn't add up either. So there's various possibilities people have offered for this experience. And the thing that I've come to from thinking about it, which Mark alluded to in his, in, in his introduction, is that it's been a problem with policy. And policy is really the key to understanding what's going on, both leading up to the crisis and since the crisis. And that's my, that's my hypothesis, which I want to describe to you today. Now, I, I'm glad there's quite a few students in the audience. I think I recognize the students from the non-students. Uh, I'm obviously a non-student. I'm a teacher. Um, but when I teach my students about what I'm going to talk to you again, I've tried to find ways to, to describe what good, good policy is. And just to summarize, and this is really what I'm going to use to describe the problems that we've had, I think of it as the principles of economic freedom, and that's going to represent good policy. So this is what I teach my students, so I'll teach you for a second. The first principle is that we should have a, a situation where uh, families and entrepreneurs, everyone is free to make decisions within, number one, a clear policy framework. It's predictable, so you know what's going on, you know what government's going to do, have some sense of the future. Second, that that predictable policy is based on a strong rule of law. This is to me a good, good policy, you'll see in a minute. Third, there are strong incentives for people to do things which improve their own welfare and welfare of society. And those incentives largely come from the market system, it's the, if you like the free market system. But of course there's a role for government, and that role for government should be limited in the sense that government's role is based on some reasonable cost-benefit analysis. And when the cost-benefit says government should do it, that's fine, otherwise the private sector should do it. So those are my, if you like, principles of good economic policy. I'll come back to those in a minute. But what I've observed in thinking about recent events and going back even a little further to understand this is that we sometimes adhere to these policies more closely and sometimes we deviate from them. And first, thinking about the United States. 
As I'm in the United States, I see these shifting, as I look at the United States, I see these shifting winds, winds of economic freedom, I'll call it that way. And in the late 60s and 70s, as I look at it, we saw we were shifting away from these principles. Policy, monetary policy became quite unpredictable, was go stop. It led to a lot of inflation, a lot of unemployment. Fiscal policy was quite erratic. We had a lot of Keynesian stimulus packages. By the way, all I'm saying has to do with both parties, Republicans and Democrats, doing these things. We had wage and price controls for the entire economy. How's that for trying to avoid the market system? We had a large increase in the number of regulations during that period of time, so, and, a, and a large increase in the scope of government. Again, I come to this from the monetary side, where I see most of all these, these shifts. P performance wasn't very good during this period. And uh, we had high inflation, high unemployment coming out of it in the United States. But what about the United Kingdom? Well. Some of you remember what it was like. It wasn't so good, 1970s. We had high inflation, high unemployment, a lot of problems. And I think if you look at the policies, you'll see similarities, not exactly the same, but certainly monetary policy. Certainly fiscal policy had the problems I described in the United States. So there's a similarity there, something to, to, to think about as a, as a correlation, something's related to the two. Then we saw a change. And again, I'm first thinking about the United States. We saw a change of policy. Monetary policy became more predictable, less go stop, more rule like, and I'll come back to that in a minute too. Uh, fiscal policy moved away from the Keynesian stimulus packages, basically tried to get the tax system right and not muck around with it very much. We had a uh, huge effort uh, in this time to reduce the amount of regulations. Uh, Again, thinking about this cost-benefit analysis from the 1970s. And so there was a big change. That change occurred, began in the late 70s, it occurred into the 80s. Ronald Reagan became president. Paul Volcker was appointed chairman of the Fed by Reagan's predecessor, uh, Jimmy Carter, a Democrat. And so there was a change. And what happened? Performance was remarkably good during this period. Economists call this the great moderation situation. UK, not too dissimilar. A change in policy. Think about how monetary policy began to change. Think about how fiscal policy began to change. Think about how trade union policy began to change. And so there was a shift. And of course, there was a political shift at the same time as well. But the 70s were not just one party either uh, in the UK. And so there's a relationship here, which is, I think, important to think about and keep in mind. And then finally, this more recent period, I call it the veering away from these principles. And here, to be sure, I'm thinking originally more about my country. Because I see, uh, I saw monetary policy beginning in 2003, 4, and 5, which held interest rates too low for too long, and really deviated from the more predictable policy of the 80s and 90s until that time. Uh, fiscal policy, again, become more Keynesian, which it tends to be to this day. Regulations increased, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. Now, what about the UK? Here, it seems to me there's more work to be done, but there's a similarity, certainly with respect to monetary policy. I'll come back to that in a minute. There are other kinds of policies, regulatory policy. But there's a similarity. And if there is, it's, a, it's an important story to understand, because what it suggests is we should go back, in some sense, to the kind of policies that emphasize markets more, that emphasize the rule of law, that emphasize predictability of policies, that's a limited role for government, et cetera. There's a message here, and it's not, this is not the only case. So given that, now let me just give you some details, if you like, kind of fill into the blanks of these kind of broad, even gross generalizations that are in my slide. And I want to spend most of my time on monetary policy. I understand some of the students have been studying monetary policy, and it's, it's as they say, um, I love. So I'm going to first illustrate these changes, you know, more, more than just me saying it went from go stop to something else, but just to give you something to take home, to think about. So this picture is the inflation rate in the United States. And it goes back to the period of the mid-50s. And you can see how it increased and decreased. The great inflation period was the bad period, and then it got better. So think about monetary policy in this same chart. One way to think about monetary policy is through what the interest rate was that the Fed was setting at the time. So I've, to, to help you see that, I've drawn a line at an inflation rate of 4%. The vertical axis, you can see the four. The 
black flat line is 4%. And then illustrated two different interest rate settings by the Central Bank of the United States. One, in 1968, where the interest rate was 4.8%, just a smidgen above the inflation rate. Not really enough to contain the inflation, not enough to put downward pressure on inflation, not enough of a tightening of policy to, to lead to price stability. And lo and behold, inflation rose and continued to rise, and basically until there was a change. And then if you look after the change, you see the same inflation rate, 4%, and I've shown you what the short-term interest rate is, the federal funds rate, almost twice as high, 9.7%. That was a different policy. See, the shift in policy is symbolic of a move from a stop-go, stimulative types of policy which backfired to one which uh, was more sensible, focused on price stability, and the inflation rate is much lower, and in addition, the unemployment rate came down as well. Now, I just continue this because I need to show you the veering away. So you, now the inflation rate is 2%. At least I've drawn in a line so you can see 2%. And I put in top of that line two different interest rate decisions of the Federal Reserve. The first one, 1997, the interest rate is 5.5%. So that's maybe the kind of interest rate which would tell, tend, to, tend to contain things, prevent inflation from rising or prevent overheating or search for yields or uncertainty. And then I've drawn in what was decided in 2003. Same inflation rate, roughly the same state of the economy, about the same level of capacity utilization, and the interest rate is only 1%. This is a different policy, and this is the kind of thing I'm talking about of a shift in policy that you can see, I think, very visually. Now, fortunately, there's more to go on than just looking at these examples. And what's, what there is to go on is actually sometimes related to the so-called Taylor Rule. Now, I have a problem. I wish it wasn't called the Taylor Rule, because every time I mention it, I lose all credibility. Nobody believes what I say, what, is, what the guy's just trying to promote his own rule. So I'm just going to try to refer to other people's research on the rule to give me a little more objectivity. OK, so here's the first chart. This is, a, this is now trying to, to convince you this about this shift in policy towards more rules-based and then away from it. So this is a picture actually produced by the Federal Reserve in 1995. And this little equation on the right is what people call the Taylor Rule. It says R, the short-term interest rate, should equal the inflation rate P plus a half times how far the economy is from its potential Y plus a half times the difference between the inflation rate and two, that was the target, plus two. Two is basically the, a constant which gives you a long-term interest rate of 4% for the short rate. And then this picture shows you what the rate was actually in the 70s and late 60s, and you can see it was quite a bit different, quite a bit below, quite a bit volatile, but quite a bit below that thing. So it was off, this rule. It was not rule-like. It was quite different. And then you see the change. I mentioned Paul Volcker coming in and Alan Greenspan replacing him, and you see quite a bit of change. Now, now we're going to the so-called good period I'm talking about, where policy is more rule-like. And you see, in a, in a surprising to many people, co correspondence between the policy and a rules-based measure. And the last part of that is drawn after we did the research on this policy rule, so it's actually somewhat predictive. Okay, so that's kind of a description of moving uh, from uh, a stop-go, non-rule-like policy to a rule-like policy. Now let me take some other chart, also from the Federal Reserve. This is the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. The concept is very similar. This was done by the president of that bank um, a number of years ago. And here we're taking the uh, federal funds rate, the interest rate is the black line, and we're also showing you the value that would come from the Taylor rule or similar policy, and they're quite close. So this is like this continued then through this period I mentioned. It's the, draw, the line's drawn through about 2002. Pretty good, corresponds to this good period. But then look what happened. So then you have this period where the rate gets very low, the guideline says it shouldn't be so low, and there's this gap. So people began to write about it at the time. This is a picture from The Economist magazine back in 2007. So they, they wrote that Taylor Rule in, not me, so maintaining some objectivity, I hope. And you can see that gap. So there's this kind of easy for their readers to see, and it's a huge gap, okay? And so that's really the context which you can, if you look at research, you look at analysis, 
you can see that there was something, something went on. Now, the, the harm from this, of course, is that very low interest rate can cause a boom in the housing market, which I think it did, excesses in the housing market. It can cause a search for yield and extra risk taking, which I think it did and we saw later. Um, it even may have something to do with regulators looking away when they see extra risk taking in commercial banks and other financial institutions. In any case, that seemed to happen at the same time. So there's a big deal here. And I think that's why I begin to say that part of the explanation for what happened is this deviation from, in this case, a, a simple policy rule. Just to show you this is not just the United States before I come back to the UK, this is a picture which was done by the OECD just to show you how uh, sort of a striking uh, international impact so what this does is try to s accumulate all those gaps between the interest rate and the rule, between non-rule and rule-like policy, and accumulates those gaps over a period of time, 2001 to 2006, on the horizontal axis. Some of the differences between the interest rate and the Taylor rule. And in the vertical axis, it shows you the, how much of a housing boom there was in these countries. Now, these countries are all in the Eurozone. The UK is not here. But with only one interest rate for those countries, some are going to be closer to a good rule and some are going to be away. Look at the ones that are away. Ireland, Spain, and Greece. So it's the same deal. Those are away because those rates for those countries were too low at the time and it added to the bubble-like behavior that eventually had the problem in those countries. Now what about the UK? The UK didn't have an interest rate of 1%, as you know, at that period of time. So can you make the same argument? Well, here I want to refer to some work that the former, recently former deputy governor of the Bank of England uh, performed back in 2010. I just looked it up to be sure of the date. He found that the interest rate at the Bank of England was also too low, low or below the level of policy rules that he described in that paper produced in 2010. He also found that 46%, this is just one study, which is an example, 46% of the housing boom price bubble observed in the UK was due to this policy. Okay, so there's some indication that something similar happened here too. I didn't think about that at the time I first wrote this, but it seems to be there as the, as the other evidence internationally shows. Okay, so that's kind of like the, the beginning of the problems. now. During the crisis, during the panic, during October, November, especially of 2008, there was a lot of interventions by central banks, good interventions, I'd say, both by the Bank of England and by the Fed and others to stem the, the tide of the panic, lender of last resort activity. So this period where you see this deviation, fortunately, even though I think the panic was due to a lot of these policies, policy came through, which is quite good. But then what happened after that, and this is part of the question of why the recovery has been so weak, part after that, policy went back to a very unrule-like policy, unconventional, unprecedented kind of policies, whatever you want to call it, quantitative easing in the United States, forward guidance in the United States, and now at the Bank of England, a whole rash of policies which there's debate about whether they worked. As I look at the analysis, I don't think they did much at all. I think they did some harm. But at least you have to say they were not very rule-like or predictable. And they change all the time. The quantitative reasons very hard to describe in terms of some kind of a predictable procedure. So, so we deviated. And I think that's continued to this day. There's a lot of talk about moving back to a more rules-based policy, but we're certainly not there yet. And I put that forward as an example of this major shift uh, for, from rule-like, good policy, principles of economic freedom, however you want to call it, and what we have actually have had. And of course, the results are not so good. There's a real issue in economics about going from correlation to causation. But let me just make a couple of observations about that. The change in policy that took us from the bad 70s to the better 80s and 90s occurred before that change in performance. No question about that. 
You can even see the people who made the change and they were changing it because of the economic problems and the economy got better. So there's a causation, time causation, temporal causation, which makes that clear. What about the more recent one? Isn't it reasonable to say, oh, they had to do all those things because of the financial crisis? Well, that's a reasonable thing to say, but the truth is many of these actions began before the financial crisis, and I'm referring in particular to the Fed and with some evidence from the Bank of England and the other central banks that I showed you. So there's some causation there too. Um, maybe more debatable, but I think it's quite clear. Now, let me just mention some of the other things because I think there's fiscal policy, which falls into the same category in the United States big time. We moved back towards stimulus packages in 2009, 2008. This is not a partisan position. 2008, President Bush had a stimulus package. Um, let me just show you my picture of his stimulus package. Um, his stimulus package was, was not unlike um, Alistair Darling's stimulus package in a sense. Um, taxes were temporarily cut uh, or money was handed to people. And this shows you the top line is the green, the green top line shows you disposable personal income for all Americans, all added up. And there's two big blips. One was the 2008 stimulus and the next was the 2009 stimulus. 2009 is, is a little shorter because it was spread out. And then below, I show you actual consumption, personal consumption expenditures added up for all the people in the United States. And you can see it's, you're really hard put to see that this stimulated consumption or thereby stimulated the economy. I have this little thing here, it may be hard to see, the effect of another stimulus called cash for clunkers where we would give a, uh, some payments to people who turned in their car to buy a new car, turned in their gas guzzlers to buy a new car, and it didn't seem to have much effect at all. Any effect it had sort of wore, wore away after a little bit. So there's a lot of research like this that I've done and others have done, which I think raises questions about those policies. I want to say, I don't want to say there's this consensus about this. Indeed, there's quite a bit of debate. But I think this kind of chart tells you. In any case, it was a return to more discretionary, less rule-like fiscal policy. Uh, which we used in the 70s, and I think a lot of people said, hey, it doesn't work, we keep away from it, and we did for, for a couple and a half decades, but then came back to it. And to some extent, the same thing happened in the UK. I mentioned the temporary uh, reduction in the VAT. Um, that have much effect? Well, you can tell me more than I can tell you from looking at the data, but it was temporary and had to be re removed. It didn't cause a, cause a sustainable expansion. But there was a lot of increase in borrowing, a lot of increase in debt, not all because of policy, but some, and that had to be reversed. And so the reversal is, is a temporary thing. You get some, maybe get something in the short run, but it pulls away, and so you don't have the sustained expansion that you really need to have. So that's fiscal policy. And I could talk more, but I, but I, I think you get the point. Well, the debt in the United States, this is a current projection of where our debt is going as a share of GDP, and it's just an illustration of how the policy has led to a really unsustainable debt path. This is the ratio of our debt to GDP. It goes back to the beginning of the United States. Pretty low for most of the time in the blue line, but then kind of an explosion recently and a projected explosion to continue. So that's kind of the legacy, not entirely due to the policies, but to some extent due to the lack of control of spending in the United States. Same thing, of course, is true in a different picture for the UK, and that's why there's been an effort to address it. Okay, so that's the fiscal policy. I think a regulatory policy in the US is very similar. I don't have much to say about regulatory policy in the UK, but this is just an example. This is the increase in the number of federal workers who are engaged in regula regulatory activity. And I show you the years 2006 up to 2012. Again, this did not start in 2009. And there's a steady increase, I think, representing to some extent the impact on the uh, potential impact on the economy. If you look at the 80s, it's actually the reverse. So you have this decline in regulation. And, and that's just one part of the story, but another example of what I'm talking about. And as part of regulatory activities in the United States, major reform of financial regulation through Dodd-Frank, Dodd a major change in healthcare regulation 
uh, through the Affordable Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare. So there's a lot there. And it seems to me when you add all this up, again, it's monetary, it's fiscal, it's regulatory. You didn't talk much about taxation, but they're all very similar. And it's not exactly the same in each country, to be sure. Countries are different, different timings, different issues. But I think a remarkable similarity that needs to be discussed. And, and, and I'm coming to this, remember, from the U.S. perspective and then thinking, hey, does this also apply? Just like I came to monetary policy looking at the U.S., this would apply and it applied amazingly to other countries. So the, the, the implication of all this, it seems to me, is we need to get back to the kind of policies that worked well in the times they worked well, at least in this short span of history. And I think we can learn a lot from Hayek when we do that. These principles are not at all unlike what Hayek wrote about. Um, let me just give you some examples. So the lesson is to get back to these principles of economic freedom, as I called them, and I think Hayek can help us do that. And I'm going to consider a few ways, I'll call them lessons of how to do that, um, and then conclude. Lesson number one, on the first two items on my list were predictable policy and rule of law. Policy predictability, rule of law. They have not been stressed very much in economics over the years. I stressed them a lot, emphasized them a lot. I listened to the top because I know they're not stressed enough and wanted to put emphasis on So I have a little quote. You can you read it for yourself, but it's, it's a very good observation. Nothing distinguishes more clearly conditions in a free country from those in a country under arbitrary government than the observance in the former of the great principle known as the rule of law. Stripped of all technicalities, this means that government in all its actions is bound by rules fixed and announced beforehand, rules which make it possible to foresee with fair certainty how the authority will use its course of powers in given circumstances to plan one's individual affairs on the basis of knowledge. So that's an important lesson. I think it comes largely from these observations written many years ago from Hayek, but which I think we now know more how important they are. The second thing I'd mention is <clears throat> most of Hayek's writings that I'm familiar with, the stress on the rule of law is kind of a dual purpose. And the way I've, I've always thought about policy predictability and the rule of law is it leads to better economic performance. Again, there's a lot of reasons for that, but it, it leads to more successful economies. But Hayek illustrated another important part of this, and that is that these rules or this, these laws protect individual freedom. In fact, that was a major focus of the Constitution of Liberty. And I have some things he said about Cicero because he went way back in time to discuss this or a quote from John Locke that appears in Hayek's writings. And just from, from Locke, the end, which he means the purpose of the law is not to abolish or restrain deputies, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. There is no law, if there is no law, there is no freedom. So this dual purpose, it seems to me, is a lesson because it emphasizes two good things about predictable policy and rule of law. It leads to better performance, but it predicts something very important itself, and that is freedom in the broadest dimensions. The third thing is really important to me as someone who's been interested in the world of ideas and the world of policy. Um, when you think about a rule, it doesn't mean you don't do anything. Frequently, that's the criticism of rules or procedures. You don't do anything. And indeed, having worked in government and spoken to people I admire, like George Schultz has worked in government, there is a huge urge to intervene in government. Um, and so it's hard to say, oh, you're talking about rules-based policy, Taylor. That's all well and good, but have you ever been in government? Well, I have been in government. And I know what it's like to be pressured into doing something, or you're just worried the world will fall, will fall apart and you'll take the blame. So I think it's important to emphasize that when we say rules-based policies, predictable policy, it doesn't mean do nothing. And Hayek wrote about this very clearly. And he said we need to clear up a confusion about the nature of this system or formal laws and rules. It's the belief that the characteristic is inaction by the state. And that's just not true. Monetary policy rule doesn't mean you never change the interest rate. It means you change it in a predictable way that people can understand. It's quite, quite movable. You're doing something. In fact, it's hard to figure out what to do. It takes a lot of work. Think about law enforcement. Law enforcement doesn't mean you don't do anything. You go out and you enforce the law. It takes a lot of action. It takes, people, it takes police on the street. It takes the court system. So there's a lot going on. So, so that is an important, maybe obvious distinction. 
but very important. And the other thing is, we frequently say, well, it's a crisis, we had to do something different, we had to break the rules. But my observation from studying economics and observing frequently, that's the worst time, is you can possibly not deviate, because there's so much else going on. If you could kind of keep some steadiness to the policy, it's gonna be better. Lesson number four. Um, I have a chapter in my, my book, First Principles, that's called Who Gets Us Out, In and Out of These Messes? And the reason I put it in is, I, I t as an uh, academic and researcher, I tend not to think about personality so much, but about the policies. So I'm talking about monetary policy change. And it, I'm not mentioning people much. But the truth is, people put these policies in place. And so you have to think about that part of this, obviously, if, you think, if you're going to change things. So I wrote a lot about this. Uh, he had this, this chapter, The Road to Serfdom, Why the Worst Get to the Top. And there's a tendency to be, I think, a bias against such strongly principled people, that's my observation. Um, and somehow we need to deal with this. One idea is, well, maybe when you're choosing people, you should look for those that are overly committed to principles of economic freedom. They'll, stand, they'll stay for it a little bit more. And a couple of examples uh, from this period of time, President Reagan, when he came into office, very principled. And he, he actually had many advisors which were equally principled. Many of them actually had PhDs from the so-called Chicago School or, or related schools. Really quite a bit of change from his predecessor's advisors to him. And actually, succeeding advisors changed. So, so there's that aspect of uh, maybe overly committed, you would call. He was certainly criticized for being committed. And of course, Margaret Thatcher is the same thing. There's a famous story, which I like to tell, which you probably all know very well, that when she became leader of the conservatives, she went to visit a research arm of the conservative party called the Conservative Research Department, I believe, CRD, to see what was going on. And one of the staffers made a presentation to her about we should look for a middle way. And she was kind of infuriated. And she looked in her purse, and she just happened to have a copy of the Constitution of Liberty. I don't know if you've seen that book. It's a pretty thick book. Pulled it out of her purse, slammed it on the table, and said, this is what we're about. This is what we believe. And so it's an example, if you like, of what I'm talking about. Interesting, Keynes had quite a different view of this idea of, of people. And he argued in, in actually uh, reviewing uh, and writing uh, to Hayek about the road for surf. And he said, hey, you got this wrong. All we need to do is good, good people. It'll be fine. Well, we need to get the right people, and it's going to be fine. But it's sort of completely counter to this problem which you need to face. Lesson number five, um, you've got to be careful about even in the best of circumstances, there's going to be temptations for people to deviate from these principles. In fact, I have an example from Hayek himself. I think during the 1970s, uh, he seemed to say that we had to have discretion in monetary policy. That was a period of highly discretionary monetary policy. I think like many people, he threw up his hands. I, I would have. What are we going to do? But it did take a few more years, and Milton Friedman objected this view and, and, and actually wrote a letter to Friedrich Hayek about this, but it just shows you how hard it is to sometimes to stick to the principles um, that I'm talking about in tough times. So that's the main idea of my talk, and um, I just want to put up a conclusion and maybe answer some questions. Remember, the ideas here are that if you look at not just the last year, not just the last couple of years, we look at that not so great recovery, you look at the Great Recession, you look at the period going into that, all not so great. Let's say, as, as, a, as an economist, I'm very disappointed. I mean, it's my job. What a mess. And then you look at the period 20, 25 years before then, pretty good, not perfect. And there's theories about that, but I've given you one. And then you look at the period before that, bad policy, bad results. So I think that's what's going on. And the conclusion, obviously, is to, if you like to put, the, let the winds of freedom blow. And since I'm a teacher from Stanford University, I'm going to put Stanford University's seal up here to finish. This is how I actually like to finish my, my course in elementary economics. It's a seal, and believe it or not, Stanford's motto is de luft de freiheit vet, which is let the winds of freedom blow. For me, we've got to let the winds of economic freedom blow. Thank you.